Okay. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the clubhouse and also those viewing on Facebook. Um, you're watching the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand. I'm Gwen Robinson, past president and editor at large of Nikkei Asia. And uh, as you all know, uh, tonight we are here to um, listen to a fascinating panel, including the author of the newly published The King and the Consul, A British Tragedy in Old Siam by Simon Landy. Um, before we get to that, I just want to say uh, a reminder that uh, the club is in its final days of 2021, as we all are, and uh, we'll end uh, the year with uh, a Christmas uh, event, which uh, details of which are on our website, um, a press conference on uh, migrant workers in the pandemic, uh, open to all, which is uh, on the 16th, and uh, then will be closed over the Christmas New Year period. If you want any details, just look at our website and Facebook. Um, also tonight we're taking questions online over Facebook if you want to post any questions and of course in the clubhouse. So um, just uh, without to move straight on, I'm going to introduce our excellent panel. Um, on my far right is Chris Baker, historian and uh, longtime keen observer of Thailand and author um, with his uh, co-author, Pasuk, of many fascinating books on Thai history and also Thai politics. Uh, next to Chris is, of course, Simon Landy, uh, the author who's lived in Thailand for 40 years, worked mainly in the property sector, but also as a university lecturer and journalist. And the king and the consul draws on these experiences and several years of in-depth research Last but very not least is the publisher who made all this possible, Narissa Chakrabong of River Books. And um, uh, she will speak very shortly. Uh, so I would just like to say also personally that Simon and I had the first conversation about his idea to write a book uh, a few years ago uh, in late 2019, I think. And um, uh, when I said, Oh, what's the book about? He said, mm, property, foreign property rights in Thailand. And I said, hmm, oh. <laughs> and then when I saw the book take shape and the amazing twists and turns as you've, um, you've heard about and the uh, uh, sort of high drama of it all, uh, I think uh, it's just a superb job of making a topic that maybe wouldn't really thrill a lot of people into a fascinating read. Anyway, um, I would like to hand over to Narissa, so maybe up to the podium if you like, Narissa. Um. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, usually, as a publisher, my job is to stay in the background. Um, lots of people say that authors end up hating their publishers, publishers hate their authors. Uh, publishers hate their distributors and distributors hate their publishers. But in this case, I actually think Simon is wonderful. It's been a very smooth um, project, I think. I hope you'll agree with me. Now, I wasn't going to speak tonight, but Gwen insisted. And who says no to Gwen? <laughs> I doubt anyone does. And actually, in fact, Gwen was also the person who introduced me to Simon and uh, asked him to send me the text. So Gwen, I'm very grateful to you for that because I love this book, I think it's wonderful. Um, now I grew up in England and Thailand and I actually grew up with The King and I, um, which of course was banned here, but actually at home we watched it and I can sing all the songs. So you know, later on in the evening, if anyone wishes, I can sing a song. And so King Mungut is very dear to my heart. And I also curated an exhibition some years ago in Bangkok at the National Gallery of John Thompson's photographs. And he had very privileged access to King Mongood. And so that also just enhanced my uh, love for this king, who I think is a very remarkable character. Now, I don't want to spoil anything that Simon's going to say, but you may find that 
the way he comes across in the book is not perhaps how you would expect. And I think um, this book actually provides some very interesting and oblique looks at Thai life. Normally, as a Thai, we're brought up with a history that is very uh, hierarchical, very structured, um, doesn't really give nuance. And what I like about this book is it gives a lot of nuance to the period. Um, what did I learn from the book? I'm not going to tell you very much because I, I really don't want to spoil the story. But I learned how long everything took in those days. So if you had a crisis, you were completely screwed, really. I mean, you know, dear consul trying to get some advice from London, completely impossible at that time. Or if you wanted to travel up the river from the Bag Nam, it took a long, long time. It took 12 hours. And that was really remarkable. And of course, the property thing is one of the most important things in the book. And I certainly wasn't aware of how um, impossible it is for foreigners, was for foreigners to own land. And it's remained so to this day. And I think that's very interesting, too. Um, but without more ado, really, I think I should hand over to Simon, because otherwise I'm going to give away some of the exciting details of the book. And I hope you enjoy it. I mean, the great thing about his writing, too, is he writes extremely well. And it's very um, wonderful to have an author who is an English native speaker and writes so well. Because a lot of my authors are specialists in other areas, and they don't write so well. And I have to do a lot of work. But this has been a joy. So thank you very much, Simon. And enjoy his talk, which I'm sure you will. To you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? okay. Well, thank you, uh, Kunying Narissa and, and Gwen. And uh, also, I've, there's a lot of people to thank when you do a book like this. Uh, Chris, of course, and a number of people, some of whom are in the audience. But there's one person I'd particularly like to single out for thanks today. Uh, if I can get this to work. Boris Johnson, uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Uh, Boris may not know that I'm thanking him today and I'm very grateful for his input, and he may never know, but in fact, he's, uh, he's had a remarkable influence on this book. Some of you may know that back in 2017, uh, when Boris Johnson was at the time Foreign Secretary under the uh, Theresa May government, he made a very short visit to Bangkok and one of the uh, items on his agenda was the the sale of the embassy the 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 British embassy on wireless Plenji Road uh, of course by that time the sale had already been agreed so there wasn't a lot that could be done to stop it but there was a lot of there were a lot of people in Thailand who were very upset about it shall we say not only in the British community also in the Thai community uh, I had a, a very brief encounter with, with Boris uh, when he was here, and I knew it was too late to do anything about the sale of the embassy, but I did want to ask him about what, for want of a better term, I'll call the historic assets. These are parts of the embassy compound that had a particular historic resonance. On the top, of course, is the old ambassador's residence built in the 1920s. Uh, on one side we have the, on the left, the, the war memorial built around the same time, a memorial to uh, post-World post War I. And on the right, the statue of Queen Victoria, which was actually predates both of these. It was built in 1905. Anyway, when I got my five minutes, or more like two minutes, with Boris, uh, I did question him on these assets and uh, appeal that something might be done to preserve them. And it was really his, his complete lack of interest in preserving these assets, and in fact, in the historical perspective at all, which uh, spurred me to look in greater detail at how the British came to own this land and how these assets came to be developed. And what I found when I looked into the history uh, was not, not so much a controversy about this land, 
because there had been rumours that the land could not be sold if it had been given to the British government by the Thai government. But that wasn't the case. The, the, the transaction in 1926 was commercial, so there was no impediment to the sale. But what, what I did discover was that back in 1856, when the British had first uh, acquired land, that land had been given to them for free. And it was that story that I found particularly fascinating. So I'll just give uh, maybe 15 minutes maximum, I hope, on uh, the historical context of the book. Uh, of course, we're going back to the 1850s. Queen Victoria is on the throne of England, you, or Britain, I should say. Britain is a forward-looking, globalizing superpower. Uh, King Mongkut comes to the throne of Siam, as it, Thailand was known then, in 1851, and is determined to change the direction of travel. Siam had been a rather inward-looking, self-sufficient economy. He knew the time was for change, and so he encouraged the, uh, uh, the liberalization of the economy. Am I getting an echo? It's okay? Okay. And uh, part of that liberalization, of a big part, was to attract the British, because the British were the dominant superpower of the era. And in 1855, this gentleman, Sir John Bowring, or Bowring in Thai, arrived in, in Siam to negotiate the first major commercial treaty between Siam and Great Britain. It was a huge success for Sir John. The treaty was able to, it focused mainly on trade issues, and it, he was able to negotiate pretty attractive terms, 3% import duty, and lots of other benefits. Also, you know, questionably beneficial to Siam in some ways, obviously not beneficial in other ways. Uh, most of what we know about the Boeing Treaty comes from a book that Sir John wrote on his return to Hong Kong after, the, after his uh, mission to Siam. In 1857, he published The Kingdom and People of Siam. And in this book, he, he reprints his diary. It's a fascinating account of his interactions with, uh, with the Siamese authorities. However, it doesn't tell the whole story, of course. It just tells it from his perspective. So I was keen to see if there was any other information out there. And assisting me in this quest was, of course, the wonderful resources of the National Archive in the UK and the surprisingly wonderful archive of the National Library, which incorporates part of the National Archive in Bangkok. Both were invaluable in this research. One of the documents that uh, came to light, I, I don't think it was a secret, but I don't think it had been well explored, was uh, another British account. This one written by this gentleman with the very fine whiskers, Harry Parks. Uh, Harry Parks, at the time, was secretary to the Boeing mission, so he was, he was the main man, if you like, who would do the day-to-day -day negotiation with the Siamese. And the Siamese at that time uh, were a, a team of five people. On the left, you had the younger generation who were proponents of change, the liberal elite, if you like. On the right, the conservative faction, the opponents of change. And all these four people are, uh, as you may know, members of the same family, Bunag family. The two on the left are brothers, their father is on the upper right and their uncle on the lower right. Up in the middle, uh, sitting as kind of royal referee, was Prince Wong Sa, who was the, the king's brother, the only royal in the, in the negotiating team. Uh, but his inclination was more on the liberal side. So in the end, it became a, a liberal, liberalizing victory. Uh, Move on. 
And so in 1856, the treaty was agreed. Oh, in fact, 1855, the terms were agreed. And Sir John Barry went back to Hong Kong. Harry Parks was told to go to London to get the treaty ratified by the foreign secretary, which he did. He then came straight back to Bangkok to have it ratified by the Siamese government. Um, in his four months in the UK, he'd had time to not only get the treaty ratified, but meet, fall in love and get married and bring his wife out with him. So they ended up in Bangkok in, in March 1856. But what they found when they got to Bangkok was not what they expected. Ratification was not going to be a simple process. And the problem was a new issue, or not a new issue, but an issue that had been kind of overlooked had become very prominent in the Siamese authorities' mindset. And the big issue was not really about the trade negotiations, which had been agreed, but about property. And this is where the property issue comes in. One of the clauses of the Bowering Treaty said that foreigners were allowed to own, to purchase land within a certain radius of Bangkok. But it wasn't very clear. It said within 24 hours travel distance. And travel was defined as by a, by a regular boat. And the king and his advisors thought that this was just too vague and was likely to be abused. So they wanted something more definite. Uh, and so they, they, Harry Parks commissioned a detailed survey which in the end defined a boundary. This is, this is, this is not a map from the time. But this is my, my kind of interpretation of it from the written record. But basically everything outside of the, the dark black line, north of Lotbury, south of Pejabury, was off limits. Foreigners could not buy in any land in that area. But anything within that, that uh, circumference, land could be bought freehold, except for another circle around Bangkok, in the immediate vicinity of Bangkok, in fact, within four miles of the Grand Palace, land could not be bought by foreigners, but it could be leased by foreigners. And this regulation, everyone was happy in the end, they'd got it all sorted out, they'd put markers in the ground, everybody knew the rules. Uh, but this regulation became a source of great uncertainty and uh, a source of conflict in the, in the year that followed. Uh, and so we come to the, the second character in my story. Uh, two months after Harry Parks left Bangkok, the first British consul arrived, a gentleman called Charles Batten Hillier. Hillier had been chief magistrate in Hong Kong, and he, he was sent over by Boring to be the first British consul with his lovely wife, Eliza. Uh, they arrived in June, and uh, property wasn't the first thing on their mind, but as soon as they landed, they were confronted with this. Uh, this building. It uh, looks quite pleasant there, but in fact it was a complete mess. It was a disaster. And Eliza couldn't stand it. Charles said, there's no way I'm, I'm living in this place. And so the number one mission for Charles over the next few months was really, how do I, how do I get an embassy? How do I get a proper building? And within a year or 12, 18 months, that mission had been accomplished. And this became, it's not moving. This building became the first purpose-built British consulate in Siam, in Bangrak. It's on the river, what is now the head office of the Communication Authority of Thailand. Now, the, 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 hub, the nub of this book and the, what uh, Gwen was referring to as some of the uh, 
uh, interesting, uh, if, if you like, uh, tragic events of the book occurred during, in the negotiation between this uh, arrival of Charles and this realization of a, an embassy. Now, it's a history book, so I can't really promise you sex and drugs and rock and roll. But there is a bit of drugs. There's, some, there's definitely some morphine that plays a big role in the death of one of the protagonists. And rock and roll, not so much, but if, as, uh, as uh, Kunying Narissa was saying, the, the journey up from the Jaupre River took from nine to 12 hours in a rocking and rolling boat that was extremely uncomfortable. So uh, there's also a couple of very tragic deaths along the way. Uh, I don't really want to go into too much detail in there because uh, it would kind of spoil it. It's, I mean, the, the history is the history. It's not a secret. But it's amazing how, how, if you like, unknown this particular story has been. So moving on, I'll just talk a little bit more about what happened after to the embassy. So the, so the, the British moved into this building in 18, the 1st of January, 1858. And they remained there until 1926, when the embassy was moved to Plungit Road. This is a picture from the 1920s. That's what it looked like when they first built it. Uh, and they stayed here, as we know, until a couple of years ago, when they moved out to, uh, well, the embassy moved out to the AIA building on Saturn Road and the ambassador's residence moved out to the river, back to close to where it used to be. Uh, this is a little map. I don't know if I can... So the, the original location was of the consulate, the British factory, was right here. That's, this area is called Kudi... Kudi the, it's an old Chinese Portuguese community uh, and n near Santa Cruz Church, if you know that area. And then they moved right here next to the Portuguese consulate in 1858, then out to Plungit in 1926, and then embassy to Saturn and ambassador's residence to uh, back to, back to Jaruan Grung Road the same road that they occupied in 1858. In fact, you can, you can see from the new residence, you can see the old residence, if it was there, but it, which of course it isn't. Uh, more interesting, maybe, is what happened to Queen Victoria. Uh, here she is, when she, where she was first erected in, in 1905. In f and you can see this is the the, the Bang Rack Embassy at the back. This is Jerome Grung Road. And she's outside the wall, fully accessible to the public, uh, facing out with the embassy behind her. In, when they moved to 1920, in 20, 1926, she was now inside the compound, but still facing out. Here's the war memorial. Here's the queen. Here's, here's the residence. So she was still facing out, and for a while, at least, uh, res people could go and visit her, and as some of you know, people did go, and actually she became quite popular. People would go and pray for children from her. But anyway, she, she stayed there until the early 2000s when the British Embassy sold this front portion of the land. The War Memorial had to be moved. It was moved more or less to where the Queen, Vi Queen Victoria is now. And the statue of Queen Victoria was moved back here behind the embassy, looking in, looking into the embassy. And that's how things stayed until very recently. And now, of course, the whole property has been demolished. Queen Victoria, uh, I found out last week, is now back on the main road. Here she is on Soy Som Kit. Uh, again, she's on a road looking out. But now she's looking out at the car park of Central Department Store. And behind her is, uh, rather than the, the might of the British Empire, 
we have the might of a central development site. Anyway, make, make of that what you will. I'd just like to finish by uh, saying a little bit more about the, these archives and some of the material, giving a couple of examples of some of the interesting material that we found there. Um, first, in the, an, in the uh, British archives in Kew in London, uh, there's this letter uh, from the king to Captain Puddicombe, who was uh, one of the main protagonists on our, in our story. And, uh, and he got into a lot of trouble. But the king regarded him, surprisingly, as a good friend. He says, are you not my old friend? Long has been my very intimate, worth more than 10 years. So for more than 10 years, the king knew this, knew this man quite well. And despite him getting into big trouble, he still regarded him as a friend. And I think it shows how, in a way, how small the community was in Bangkok in those days, at the elite level. Everybody knew everybody. And then from the Thai archive, the, these wonderful documents, uh, this is a, from a couple of years later, where the, uh, the king is obviously addressing his, his ministers and talking about the new British consul who's just arrived, his name is Schomburg. And he's saying, Schomburg's actually not a bad guy, you know, especially when you compare him to Hillier. And uh, uh, he, he calls Hillier na bung, which sort of means grumpy and sullen. And, and I, I'll just read you what he says uh, in, in English. Uh, After only a couple of days, he started demanding this and that. If we didn't respond quickly enough, he would make accusations and threaten to immediately bring in a ship of war, using every issue to threaten Siam every day. I mean, you could just feel the frustration there. Anyway, that's the frustration that underlay the culture, the culture clash that really stands at the heart of this book, The King and the Consul. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Simon, for uh, a fascinating romp through, uh, through your very fascinating book and, uh, and also uh, holding back, I think, some of the juicier bits, although we, we did get a bit of rock and roll, I suppose. Um, just before we go to Chris Baker, um, uh, just to remind people, the book is for sale here up at the uh, up at the desk uh, near the entrance um, at a uh, a good price. And uh, if you are thinking of buying it, the author is here on the spot to sign copies if you if you um, like. And uh, now we will turn over to Chris Baker. <coughs> Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you very much to Simon for that, which was great. I, I like this book very much. Uh, Simon asked me to read it some, some time ago, and, and I loved it from, from the beginning. Well, I, what I'm going to do at the moment is to put a little bit of context around it and, and say why I like it. You know, it's very difficult to write history that combines the sort of big themes of the world and the human touch of what is actually going on in the ground. And this, this book does that job exceptionally well. Because what we have here is one of the great moments in Siam's modern history. The Bowering Treaty is rightly seen as a major event. It's the point at which uh, the British, followed by the rest of the Western world, blast open the door into Siam. And by doing so, they start to drag Siam into the modern world. So there you have the big themes. But when, how those themes work out in practice depends upon people. And there are both big people and little people involved. And their fates in this story are very different. And the big people involved here, as Simon has said, are King Mongkut and Sir John Bowring. And 
What is fascinating is that these are both desperate men at the time that this happens. Sir John Boring had, had a brilliant early career in England as a leading liberal intellectual and politician, for, you know, a spearhead of free trade and rather anti-imperialistic. He had then got himself desperately into debt and as a result of that had accepted to become governor of Hong Kong and finds himself at the spearhead of British imperialism beating on China. So his career is in absolute ruins at this point, and he desperately needs the success of this mission to Siam to give him some kind of credibility. Moncourt is also a little bit desperate. He's only been in, there, in the job, as it were, for four years, and he's, as Simon has shown, he's caught in this uh, clash of factions in the court between different parts uh, of the Bunak. So he also desperately wants a success. And as a result, they negotiate this treaty. And you have to remember, British have been trying to negotiate a treaty with Siam for 35 years. They do it in three weeks. You know, the, the, the minds are so concentrated on, on getting this, this done that it happens very, very quickly. But as a result, it leaves loose ends, which is where the tragedy comes in. So then you come down to the little people, and the little people, particularly these two people, Hillier, the consul, and a, a Thai, a very interesting Thai called Seng, both of whom die in, in the, the climax of this book. Now, yeah, that's a spoiler alert. We have to have we have to have that in, but that's why you know, and they they are interested. They are, they are fascinating in, in two, both of them are fascinating characters, and they're fascinating in the context of this amazing change that, that is going on. You know, at this time, the British Empire is expanding so fast, it needs more and more people to administer the empire. So there are people like Hillier, who perhaps, if it wasn't at this particular time, he'd have been a local solicitor or a schoolmaster somewhere in England, like that. But he suddenly finds himself the head of the British Empire entering Siam. You know? And he's completely out of his depth, and also not only, I think, in terms of talent and training and everything else, but also his health. And as a, as a result of that, he becomes the tragic victim of these grinding of the big wheels of history. Seng is even more interesting. There is very little known about him, but Simon has dug out the key document, which is fascinating, that shows that he had been in the monkhood. He'd been part of the Tamayut, early Tamayut monks around monkhood. And after that, he'd gone to be a royal page. After that, he had come to be a teacher of some of the, Engle the, 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 the Farang turning up in Siam, and then he drafts a legal document that gets himself into trouble and punished, and he dies. But here is this man who is clearly an extraordinary character, you know, obviously a, a very talented man and an intellectual who has found himself totally between these two worlds. Right? And, and, that, and that is really what, uh, what brings him down. So this is a marvelous story, I want to say. Now, I uh, want to bring out a couple, two other points that I think Simon uh, you know, might have given a little bit more attention to. How do we do this one? The first is, the first is that the Siamese at that, this point in their history had very good reason to absolutely distrust these foreign that they were dealing with. The British and the French, as we well know, had kind of agreed already informally they would carve up Siam. You know, it just, it was how it was going, going to work out. And of course, eventually it did not. The Farang who were turning up in Siam, the first one, Neil wrote one of the first kind of travelogues in coming into Siam. And he writes, this is page one of his book, you know, there are at best semi-barbarous people and oppressed and cringing people wrapped in grossest ignorance and so on and so forth. And he goes on like this for page after page. And the clear upshot of that is we ought to make them a member of the British Empire as soon as possible. You know? I mean, this... It, it, so, and there's lots, of article, there's lots of documents like this. So the Chinese had right to be nervous. And you also have to remember that Bowering is not anyone except the governor of Hong Kong, the drug capital of the world, the Medellin Colombia of its time. And the British Empire at this time is based on the fact 
that the British have found they can grow opium in India, their possession, and sell it to the Chinese and make huge amounts of money. And they are trying to line extend into other Chinese commun communities in Asia. And they've been trying to do this. And a major part of this treaty is about that, which is also sort of really glossed over. So the Chinese had you know, a, a good reason to be very nervous about this whole procedure. I think the other part is to come back to Simon's sort of major theme uh, about land. And he, he, he writes at the crucial part of the book that the, the dilemma in 1856 about land was and is how to ensure the kingdom is a, as attractive as possible to foreign capital while at the same time protecting the land market from too much of this same foreign capital. Okay, And uh, Simon's argument is that this incident kind of confirmed this view uh, right down to the present. Now, the issue of land in Siam is, is very, inter very interesting. And it's famously said, going back to before the Bangkok era, to the Ayutthaya era, that the king claimed to own all of the land. And in the old Ayutthaya laws, there's these two, these two clauses which say, basically, the king owns all the land and therefore no one else can. However, if you look through all of these laws, and I'm translating a lot of these at the moment, these are just these two clauses in a great sort of fat stack of laws over three or 400 years. And then if you look at the, uh, the, 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 the civil list, at the shape of the government, there's absolutely no administrative machinery to enforce the king's ownership of land in any way. And then if you look at other laws, you can see that people are buying, selling, mortgaging, pledging, doing all kinds of things with land, as if it's owned without any conditions and without the king being involved. So in fact, there's kind of no state land law in Thailand at the Siam at the beginning of this period. And in a sense, the Siamese are making it up as they, they, they go along. And part of this making up at the go, they go along, it comes about because of this treaty. Now, uh, Simon argues very well that uh, the Siamese, the Thai have, uh, governments have been very, very reluctant to allow foreigners to have land rights, particularly ownership rights. But the fact is, they've been very reluctant to let the Thai have land rights as well. Right? So even though they finally got round to passing a law on land titling in 1901. At first, that was really only used to give titles to the royal family and some of the aristocrats around Bangkok. And going, getting up to, to about 1950, it was still only 5% of the land had been given a full land title. At that point, the World Bank got involved and pressed for a bigger distribution of land titling. And there was a big effort through from about 1960 to 1980. But the position currently still is that 60% of the land in Thailand is officially owned or controlled by the state, by the government, and only 40% by uh, private owners. Okay? It, it's a bit it, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but basically it's still 60-40. By comparison, in the UK, state owns 8.5% of the land and the royal family another 1.4%, so much, much less than we have here. US is a, is a bit more because there's lots of national parks and other things. So I would like to end by asking Simon that although he, you make this point that it's been very difficult uh, for foreigners to own land. Is that really true? I mean, from your own experience in working in the real estate business over the last 20-odd years, was it not, in fact, with so many sort of workarounds and, and shortcuts, actually so relatively easy still compared to some of the neighboring countries? Over to you. 
well, I think uh, I, I, I see. I, I agree with what you're saying about the uh, the state attitude to land ownership in general is is very uh, proprietorial, and but if you you're bringing comparisons with neighbouring countries, I think it's it's very it's very different. I mean, if you're talking about uh, I mean, not so much neighbouring, but countries in the area. If you let's say you ta you take state-controlled countries where land is is pretty much all owned by the state, uh, you have uh, let's say Vietnam, China, to a certain extent Mi Myanmar, although that's debatable. Uh, w my 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 argument would be that yes, it's difficult for anyone outside of the state to get control of land to to get ownership of land, but uh, where Thailand has been, I'd say, different from its neighbors is in its reluctance to even consider respectable leasehold terms for, for foreigners, or even for Thais, actually. Uh, so the maximum term of a lease under Thai law is 30 years. In theory, you can get a 30-year renewal, but uh, it's debatable, it's got some questionable legal status. Uh, in Vietnam, say, or China, or even Singapore, uh, you can get much longer leases. Even So you may get a 70-year lease to develop land in, in, in uh, Vietnam, whether you are Vietnamese or, or foreigner. In Thailand, you will get a 30 year with a questionable 30 on top if you are Thai or a foreigner. So there's, there's total equality in that sense. But on the ownership side, there is inequality. So countries that don't have free freehold ownership of land are actually more liberal for foreigners in that sense. And then you turn to the other countries in the region which do have freehold, like Malaysia, Singapore, of course, uh, Singapore perhaps, uh, but Malaysia certainly, and uh, Indonesia, Philippines. And in these countries, I'd say they're very similar to Thailand in that sense, in that uh, split, the bifurcation between leasehold and freehold. But again, in all of them, except po possibly the Philippines, you do get much longer leasehold rights. So I don't know if that kind of answers. Well, can I, can I just add to that and say I think the really big difference, the mega elephant in the room is like you talk about state land, 60% versus 40%, but within that 60%, what are we talking about with crown property, which is puts Thailand in quite a, a, a different category. I don't know how it compares with other countries with that kind of, you mentioned a percentage uh, held by the royal, the British royal family or you know, the Japanese royal family, but the Japanese royal family have no right to move the title deeds of that property into their own personal accounts. Whereas perhaps the situation's different here. I don't know, but perhaps you could just, um, just maybe let's just talk about it. So now we're all gonna get into big trouble. Oh no, we're not trying but to get okay. you into Actually, I, I don't know the answer to that question at all, but I mean, if you're looking at state ownership, it takes many forms, whether it's royal or, or, or government. I mean, what would you call it in China? I don't know. It's, it's, it, it, you have state enterprises, you have, you have different entities that... Well, different categories, different sure. Categories. But, but, but this is a kind of basic, you talk about the bifurcation of... Um, yeah land, but surely within that 60% owned by the state, what? Yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that. Right. And if I did, I probably wouldn't say. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, go I on. I think in, in terms of per percentage of that, <coughs> it, we're, when we're talking in terms of area, the, the Crown property would not feature, <coughs> probably be significantly less than the UK, because the UK is a lot of old in ancestral lands from being landholders, so they're big, they're, a lot of it is quite big estates. But the land that was acquired by the, particularly by King Chulalongkorn, um, 
is, is not so much its extent, but its value, because it is all in the old, not all, it's a very large part of it is in the royal center of Bangkok. And other parts are in many of the major towns around the center of the Chao Phya Delta, because uh, they, 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 they targeted areas next to markets in these towns, which are now in the center of these big towns. So in terms of area, it's not so big. In terms of value, it's huge. Right, I see. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to questions, and I can see we've got one there already. So I'll let you go before uh, I'll ask my other question. Peter, can okay. you <laughs> introduce yourself? And uh, Peter Jansen, freelance journalist here. Simon, uh, your thesis, or part of the thesis of this book is that this incident, uh, tragedy, whatever, uh, has some influence on uh, Thai uh, uh, attitude towards selling property or giving foreigners the right to ownership of property. I mean, you know, for me, this was all very new when I read your book. I didn't know anything about it. It was kind of revealing and whatnot. Did you find in your research that Thai officials are aware of this history, that it's, it's, it's a set a precedent among uh, uh, the, the politicians who are setting uh, property laws and whatnot? Or did you find that Thais are just as ignorant as, as I was of, uh, of this, these little incidences? Uh, I found no awareness anywhere <laughs> of this. But, but uh, my point really was that uh, it, it set, as, as Chris actually put it better, it, it set a precedent and it, it uh, confirmed a, a way of thinking rather than being a, a conscious decision to follow that, that, that model. Thanks. Um, I actually would like to get another question in, which is that, that um, as, a, as a journalist reading your book, it seemed to me full of like fascinating uh, bits and pieces, including this gruesome, awful, uh, <laughs> unfortunate end of uh, Seng uh, um, and uh, certain other aspects of his uh, demise as well as uh, other things. And I was just wondering what if your research in the archives and uh, extensive uh, investigations elsewhere, what excited, what is actually, do you feel there were scoops in there? I had not read about um, that kind of extraordinary scene that you outline uh, I, I don't think it's I don't know I don't know I don't know in that I mean it make a good headline for sure <laughs> so but uh, it's not unknown the story is not it's not a secret it's 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 there if it's not just in the primary sources there's a there's maybe in fact there's one one particular Thai historian Kajon who has written about these events uh, but he made them into a kind of uh, a moral story or a thesis of, uh, and his his thesis was uh, that these events were instrumental in in helping steer Siam, which in uh, away from uh, a slave slavery and the the abolition of slavery by King Cholongkorn was a culmination of the events that started with uh, with this gruesome with this gruesome uh, death but right. uh, otherwise history historians have been pretty silent on this topic i don't know why um, you you do refer to unpublished previously unpublished siamese documents so presumably some of that was actually brand new in terms of publicizing this stuff yeah i i think the there was one in particular, there's a, uh, one government official was sent by, well, uh, in 1850, later in 1856, 1857, uh, the, uh, the British in Hong Kong under Bowering and, and Harry Parks, who was in Canton at the time, started the, the Second Opium War, bombarding, bombarding uh, Canton. And uh, King Mongkut, had a ship which was trading in Canton and he lost a lot of goods in this bombardment. 
So he sent an official over, uh, Naikam, his name is, he was from the Royal Pages Department. He sent him over to s speak to Bowring and try and get the British government to, to give some kind of compensation for this, <laughs> for this lost ship. Anyway, uh, there's a, there is a document in the Thai archive, a fascinating document with, where Naikam is reporting to his boss that yes, I, well I, I, I bowled up at Boring's place, but Boring was busy. But anyway, his man came out to speak to me and, and it's all about this amazing conversation they have, which is not really about China at all. It's about this unfortunate incident in Bangkok where this unfortunate Thai employee unfortunately died. And again, it's full of uh, aspersions from the British side on the Thai character which are not very complimentary. That was in the Thai archive. That, right. So there are documents like that that I, I, I don't know if they've been seen before. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I think we, <coughs> we, <coughs> we, should <coughs> we should, we, we need to recognize that if it was not these extraordinary circumstances of this Sang being involved with these foreigners who have just arrived, no one would have ever known about because there is no, there's no newspaper publishing at the time, there's no publishing of what goes on in the court and what they do to people. So the fact that this little window into what happened occurs at this time is very unusual. Right. Thank you. Um, James, question uh, there. James Wise, a former Australian diplomat. Um, I was, it's, a, it's a wonderful book, congratulations, and there's a lot in it for, for many people. And one thing that struck me as a former diplomat is just the account you give of the negotiation of the treaty. And in fact, although I wasn't involved directly in the negotiation of the Thai-Australia Free Trade Agreement, so much of what you describe happening in the 1850s over this three-week period um, rings true today. <laughs> because where you have uh, negotiators sitting down each day, nutting things out at an official's level, if you like, um, often coming to sort of dead ends or areas uh, that need to be resolved, but then having to refer it up the line, if you like, um, to the prince or ultimately to the king who cuts through. Um, exactly the same thing happened in well, it was uh, it, from about 2002 to 2005, in the negotiation of a free trade agreement between Australia and Thailand. Officials would get together, and Australia sort of was keen to liberalise, to open up, and uh, they would, for example, come up against obstacles from, say, the Ministry of Finance, who says, oh, we can't reduce the tariffs because we'll lose income, we'll lose taxes. We'll or the Minister of Agriculture says, oh, no, we can't, free up that sector because the farmers will be disadvantaged or whatever. What happened during those negotiations, 2002 to 2005, is um, ultimately it went to the Prime Minister, Thaksin, who performed the role ultimately which King Mongkut performed back there and just said, basically, cut the crap, we need this agreement. <laughs> and that's indeed what happened. So the whole process of the negotiation was fascinating for someone with, with my background. My and my questions are unrelated to that, but two, I suppose. One is with this land ownership. As we know, the waves of Chinese migrants to Thailand, um, very active in the commercial sector. Was there any difference during the period you've looked at between attitudes towards Chinese migrants owning land and other foreigners? Um, or did the Chinese migrants, in, in effect, a generation or two later were able to own land simply because they assimilated. They married Thais and got Thai uh, nationality. Um, and the sort of broader question, I suppose, more perhaps for Chris, is that one of our understandings, or my understandings about Thailand, when you look at its foreign policy, is unlike um, Western powers, for example, which tended to invade each other because and, and hold the territory that they won, in this part of the world, up until the modern period, there was ample land. People didn't go to war for land. They went to war for people. You actually, and for treasure. 
you went, you you took treasure, hard you know, gold or whatever you could find, and you captured people and brought them back because there was always shortages of, shortages of labour. Um, so, Chris, how, how does that fit with what you were saying before about what the records show about people actually uh, holding quite, well, putting a, quite seemingly some sort of value on uh, ownership of land during that period as well? Thanks, James. It's interesting to hear about your, how similar the negotiations were. Um, hopefully, nobody at the Australian Embassy suffered a similar fate to my saying. <laughs> uh, I think uh, at the time, uh, you know, if you, the, Bo the Boring Treaty gave certain rights specifically to British citizens, and those rights were then replicated in numerous other treaties to various other Western countries. So that cohort of foreigners had certain rights that were in fact greater, probably, than the rights of uh, ordinary Thai citizens. Because uh, generally, Siamese citizens, Siamese citizens were generally get allowed to occupy land as, uh, as, as Chris was intimating, that, so they could occupy it and utilize it. And if it hadn't been used I in three years, they, they stood the risk of losing it. And that was as pretty much as good as it got f if you were a normal Siamese citizen. And the Chinese who were coming in at that time were not differentiated at all from the Siamese in that sense. So the, it wasn't a, a, a na nation-based uh, or a nationality-based distinction. Of course, later on in the century, when uh, when the extraterritorial rights enshrined in these treaties began to be abused, and the British and the French were bringing in, well, not bringing in, but uh, there were thousands and thousands of, of Asian, non-Siamese Asian citizens coming into Siam and claiming the right to own land based on the British treaties because they were s British subjects in Hong Kong or or Malay or whatever, uh, then, then it became a, an issue. But at this period, no, there was no distinction. Mm. Thanks, uh, Simon. Yes, so please. So oh, sorry, Sayan. Chris. Um, there, there was, I cannot really now remember the details, but there were several uh, prominent cases before 1855. Uh, I think back in the 1830s which were mostly in the south of Thailand, I think they were around Nakhon Si Tamarat in that area, where Chinese uh, had settled there and were trying to get ownership rights or rights of some kind in order to I invest in plantations there. And, and th there, were, there was a big discussion then wi within the, the, the Thai authorities, which I think generally they, they refused at that point to give any, any kind of confirmation of land rights. Um, on the more general point, James, is that while it's true that until very recently, the great availability of land has tended to make it a less valuable resource than people and other things, that's only partially true because land that is well situated for this, that, or the other has always had a premium and has has had a value. And so, of course, all of the, the disputes which are in Simon's book are, of course, about such valuable land. They're not about a bit of forest off in Pachinburi or an, anything, anything like that. But um, what is true is that this, this expansion of land rights happened very slowly through the f until the 1960s. And what essentially, therefore, happened was that everything was just organized within the local community. It wasn't sort of chaos, no, but the local community would negotiate between people and settle on approving you know, who could own which plot mm. and so on and so forth. And then only later and only, uh, um, only in, you know, incompletely did the state come in and start to organize it. And in fact, to this day, within this 60%, which is officially, 
uh, still owned by the state, a very large portion of that, maybe at least half of it, is actually occupied by farmers and other people. And then there's a lot of wor workarounds done in the locality between the local gumnan and the governor and the head of the forestry in the thing and so on in order for people to get some kind of security for their rights. So it's a, it's a very chaotic, terribly chaotic system. Mm. Right. Yes, please. Uh, Mark Harris, uh, I start from the point that I haven't read the book, so I'm at a disadvantage to my two previous questioners. Uh, but it struck me, and perhaps Chris would like to comment on this, uh, unlike the Australian here who talked about the negotiations for the Free Trade Treaty, this was an era when communications were very difficult. And one of the things you find when you read the histories of colonial empires is a lot depends on the man on the spot. And the man on the spot, it depends on his health, his mental state, what sort of personality he is. And clearly, um, I think there's something going on here with regard to the man on the spot. And you also mentioned um, gunboat diplomacy. Uh, Victoria was on the throne, I think I'm right in thinking Palmerston was prime minister at the time. Of course, in 1850, he laid out the doctrine in the Don Pacifico case of defending the rights of British citizens in any country in the world, wherever ever they were. And that was the kind of classic early example of gunboat diplomacy laid out formally in Parliament. So I wonder, were the Siamese worried about this? Were they aware of uh, the way the British government were thinking uh, beyond the Don Pacifico case and such like? And it's probably a question for Chris to give us that context. Yes, I, I can't remember the exact quote now, but there was some Prussian ship that turned up in the early part of Moncourt, and the captain came to see Moncourt, and he, he just asked him straight out, he said, are you planning to take us over? <laughs> so, yeah, they were very worried. I mean, they knew that the, 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 the colonials were, 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 were really uh, very aggress aggressive at this time. This, this was absolutely clear, yeah. I'd just like to add uh, something on that. Uh, I think... Uh, Yes, of course, they were worried. But I think as far as the British were concerned at this time, King, King Monk had, had come to some kind of realization that uh, the British didn't really want to invade and take over Siam. And he said he was, he actually told his officials, look, look what happened to, to Burma. Look what happened to the Malay, the, the, the Malay states. Obviously, we don't want that happening to us. But uh, the mistake, he said, the mistake that the Burmese made was just that. They thought, the British are coming, the British are coming, we have to defend ourselves. Whereas what he said is, the British, the British are coming, but they're not coming for land, they're coming for trade. So if we, do, if we can do a deal with them on trade, they won't invade. And of course he was right. And it was the case that and there's plenty of evidence for this, that the British had no interest in, in conquering Siam at that time. In fact, they, they, at several occasions in the story, they, they tried to avoid, uh, create, avoid creating situations that would force them into a warlike posture. So, it, Chris, is this a case of like informal empire, the same way the British had a kind of informal relationship in countries in South America, you know, over things like trade, like the guano trade and stuff during the 19th century. The whole, whole notion of, of not formal empire, you know, paint, paint on the map, but informal economic empire. Yes, I mean, by, by the end of the century, almost, I mean, something like 80% of Siam's trade is going in British ships. So they just say, well, we're doing fine. Thank you very much, yeah. Ah, Richard. So, my name's Richard Farrow. Um, thanks for all the research you did in producing this book. It's always uh, really interesting to have uh, books like this. Uh, I was just curious, in your research, did you find any material for a possible another book, not necessarily <laughs> related to this incident, but something else? <laughs> that was going to be my last question. <laughs> That's what I asked him last week. Uh, 
Yes. <laughs> is that, the publisher, <laughs> your publisher is sitting here, Simon. Yeah. I, I, I have to say that there is so much material that's interesting. Uh, and, but I, I, I haven't reached a point where I can, where I've decided what, what should be the focus. Uh, it's difficult to find something that ticks as many boxes as this particular story did. So whether to make it a, a larger story or, or another niche type of uh, exercise, I, I'm not sure yet. But th there's plenty of material. Can, can I ask you about Paddy Coombe? Uh, the, 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 the letter that Simon put up at the end, the, the letter in English uh, to Moncourt, was from this character who has a wonderful sort of walk-on but very important role in the book because he is one of these adventurers who, who are, uh, he's, he's a, a Brit from Devon, I, I think, or somewhere, who, who's, who arrives in Siam. And you must remember the amount of foreigners in Siam in Bangkok at this time is about 25. You know, it's very small, small indeed. But he has this idea of having, setting up a shipbuilding business and setting up yeah. a, a dockyard, and he is trying to get the land to do that. And that is the event that, that triggers the tragedy. What happened to him? Well, Paddy Combe is fascinating. He's, he's got a great name to begin with. He's, he sounds like he's straight out of Dickens. <laughs> uh, he actually... He was based in, uh, in India for many years and, and running boats and then he, he moved to the Siam route and eventually he brought his wife and eight children to live in Siam. Uh, there were no, uh, the only other families in Siam were the, were the American Protestant missionaries, Western families, and they were living way out of town on their own bizarre anyway uh, he well I don't get I don't want to give away too much but eventually he returned to India and tried to sell his assets in in uh, in Siam and he was actually given quite a good offer and he never responded and the trail goes quiet uh, there is a, a putty comb 20 years later fighting in the British Army in, uh, in India, which could be him. Uh, I did trace his, uh, his descendants, actually, and they had some, some documents, but no, no I, there was nothing conclusive about what happened to him or his eight children and wife, unfortunately. Mm. Okay, well, I think uh, on that note, we've bombarded you with questions. I, I guess one thing, uh, I'd like to know as a, as a journalist and uh, writing such a, such a monumental research effort and putting it all together, what was the, uh, what was the hardest thing about the whole project? Uh, that question. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, no, you can't cop out. Okay. <laughs> I guess... Uh, well, was there a moment where you thought, oh, God, it's all too much, I'll never put this together in yeah, a Yeah, I think, I think the, the research was, I suppose, the most enjoyable thing. Uh, but yes, you get to a point where you just have so much material, it's organizing the material. Uh, and that's got to be the hardest thing, just how do you organize these diverse bits of information to make a coherent narrative? I would say that's the hardest thing, apart from your question. <laughs> Well, I think uh, you've done an excellent job on that. And uh, if no one has any other questions, I'd like to end the panel and remind you all that the books are for sale. Uh, Simon is here to thank uh, Chris as well for, um, uh, for coming in and your excellent observations. And Nerissa as publisher uh, uh, for making it all happen. So thank you, everyone. And uh, good night. Thank you.